how wrong and naive I was. They're bloody expensive. We thought we we thought we were done. We struggled so much. Automats to be connected to Ethernet. And you do need partners. You have to be obsessed. The light reaches the wall. I have my colorful shirt on to hide my pain <laughs> talking of this 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 topic. Welcome back to one of the last episodes of how we built our studio. And today we talk about the importance of lighting a green screen cove, the choice of lighting, and also the challenges that we've been going through. And hopefully watching this video, if you're building a green screen stage, you'll learn a couple of things about uh, the do's and don'ts of uh, building lighting around a, a green cove. So let's start from the basics. Why do you even need to evenly light up a green screen? If you go on YouTube, you'll find a lot of um, tutorials, mainly for small pop-up screens. I couldn't find a lot of uh, videos on how to evenly lit light a proper stage, a bigger stage. The reason, as you probably figured out, is because the more even your green is, the better you'll do at keying. Doesn't matter if that's in post or if you're using something like the Blackmagic Ultimate 12 uh, in order to real-time key. If you have a very similar spread of green in your background, you'll be able to do a better job at um, keying that. Because of the lack of proper information out there on how to light a bigger stage, right? Like we have a U-shaped stage. <clears throat> I mentioned previously, we have six and a half meters, three and a half meters deep, and also three meters height. You don't find that many videos and written articles about lighting this type of setup. Um, and also because I'm not in the industry for a long time and I haven't been on a lot of stages like this, um, professional stages, to see how they light it evenly and how they put it all together. I had some assumptions that turned out not to be correct. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges stem for, from. Bear in mind, I'm also not a gaffer. Now, there's another challenge. What you find in a lot of these green screen coves and stages around the world are lantern type ambient lighting. And it, when you set up a bunch of lanterns equally um, spread across the stage, then you're going to get a very smooth and very even light. As soon as I turn on the server, I talked about this um, in the episode talking about the keying server. I didn't have any lights. I had the house lights, which were evenly lighting everything. I got a really good key and I was super excited about it. But for me, the challenge stem, apart from the fact that I'm not that good with lighting, also I wanted to be able to control the light and be able to create lighting scenes. Most of the time, if you have lanterns on the stage and everything is evenly lit, it means that also your subject is evenly lit. And then you have to bring lights in and then in post or with grading kind of crush a lot of the darker. Honestly, I've seen footage done on green screen where everything is super bright and then there's additional light that's brought and you have to lower your um, ND in order to, and it's just, to me, it's a lot of extra work and also to me, it doesn't look as authentic, especially in non-Hollywood setups, right? Where you have the, the gear and the budgets of millions to be able to do a Hollywood green screen um, setup where in post you can 
super alter this. Bear in mind, we want to do stuff live here and um, focus as much as possible in production and not do post-production. So I'm rambling here, but in short, I wanted to control the light and not have the lights that are purposed to lighting the green affect the foreground and the talent. My initial thought was, can I get lights close to the wall that do not affect the, the talent? And the first thing that I've tried were actually the uh, Amaran F22X, which is like a two by two. That didn't work out. And the reason why it didn't work out was because there were too few. I had to pull them quite towards the center and front of the stage in order to get more of an even light. And also they're 200 watts, so they're not that powerful. The further away you're moving them, the the less light you'll create. But the, but the most important uh, aspect of this is the fact that it meant that I would have had to shoot outside the green stage, which in a way, one, defeats the purpose of having a green floor as well. It means that I can never do a full body shot um, or uh, scenes where you have one or multiple people and you can see them uh, from afar in a, in a very wide shot and stuff. So I wasn't really interested in doing that. And the other bit is we have limited space here, right? So if I'm putting the talent completely off the stage, then I'm pushing, uh, then I'm pushing the production in the corner or super close to the wall. So I needed to find a different solution. And again, in my naive mind, I initially thought that, oh, let me put just, um, let me get the uh, the other Amarans, the F21X, which are two by one, and put them close to the wall. I got eight of them, have mo more of them and put them close to the wall. And that will solve my problem. How wrong and naive I was. There's one thing that I missed. And I know these things, right? I know about the hot spots of light and things like that, but I, I didn't thought about the hotspot situation. Because as soon as I put these eight lights closer to the wall, you would get the top part of the wall super bright, and then the light will would fade fade away, especially that they're pointing towards the wall so that it doesn't spill on the talent. If you're pointing them down, then you know it would spill on the talent. You'd have to move the talent forward still. Um, and even if you'd point them down, you'd still have the same problem because they're close to the wall, the light reaches the wall up here first, and then it kind of like down, it, it just starts fading. Um, and, it go, and it goes back to the whole, you know, light travels faster, short distances and slower, longer distances. I don't know if that makes sense, but that means that if you're, if you're pushing the lights back, you get you're not gonna get those hot spots, and you're gonna get more of an even um, spread because the light is not traveling that fast and bouncing off the um, the actual surface. So we move them back to the second rail. So we have a pipe, a scaffold pipe that's closer to the wall, and then a second one that's closer to the middle of the stage. So we decided to unhook them and put them to on this this other pipe and we realized that we needed more lights to kind of evenly spread because with the eight we still had areas where especially at the bottom where it, it was darker than um, the areas where you had the light now also the challenge with this is like these amaran lights they're uh, two by one and they're not super powerful they're 100 watts. Normally you would maybe use some Asteras or some some other lights that are more powerful, wider. Um, that's what I've seen a lot on stages, be it green screen stages or white coves. They're bloody expensive. They're super expensive. And I wanted, I didn't want it to invest tens of thousands of, of pounds in lighting the green. So I stuck with the Amarans, bought more of them, 
we got a 1.215 of them and started putting them super close together because now we were more central with the lights on the stage depth wise we decided to also mask the lights with a skirt and I was thinking what kind of skirting material to get to be thick enough so that the light doesn't kind of reflect through it I came up with the idea to do actually acoustic blankets that are in this skirt ceiling skirt uh, profile and these are usually placed hanging from the ceiling at various distances to help with the um, reverberation and the bounce from the ceiling and what we've done was to stitch them together and put them around to not have that spill on the talent we thought we we thought we were done but we're still getting quite a lot of a hot spots we eventually decided to take the skirt down and the next step so you can see how many iterations of this we had the next step was to put the grids on the lights basically put the grids on the softbox and try to aim them a bit lower helping not get that spill on the talent of the of the lights with the because we have now the grids but also not having that crazy hot spot on the top because the light is more controlled but again it was still an issue because you would get darker top and bottom because now you're directing the light so we reverted the challenge right rather than having a hot spot at the top now we had a decent even middle and the light was fading away on the bottom and fading away on the top because of that concentrated crate around the light we struggled so much to position them to get a better spread to get the corners the corners is a completely different story and this is what i'm talking about the fact that you can't find much instructions out there the things that you find is usually hey here's a straight wall or a material on one surface here's how to light it it's not rocket science but when it comes to corners when you want to evenly light without using lanterns as i mentioned yeah lanterns are a solution for you if you want but then you have to figure out if you want to do darker scenes or moodier control the light a lot more how you're going to do that these setup i've seen a few you have to be a lot further away we have limited depth as well so we couldn't go further than this and then also it's not super explain how you treat the corners because if you think about it you have three flat surfaces um, and when you put lights around these lights in the corner here will be further away from the corners of of your cove than the lights that are on these uh, on the straight ed on the straight walls right so we struggle with that but luckily um we had nea that came in an amazing gaffer to the rescue and as soon as she started touching the lights and repositioning them it was like magic we managed to get a lot more of an even spread on the corners and on the walls which was amazing and then eventually um, she wanted to take down the grids from the soft boxes and tilt them a bit better and we wind up doing again putting again the skirting around it but i think the light is a lot lot better now but yeah it was long journey we were also getting super close to launch day and we're still fixing lights it was super stressful on top of that we also had issues with dmx stuff so i'm using Sidus pro app a lot of these lights the amarans and the apertures basically have bluetooth uh, connectivity the challenge with Bluetooth is that it's not that reliable. Yeah, usually in professional studios, you know, if if, if I give someone uh, the side this app and say, make sure you have Aperture and Amaran lines and connect them to Bluetooth, they're going to laugh in my face. So we need a DMX. So we got the side this one. You can now connect through uh, wired DMX as well as wireless DMX your lights basically any type of lights you don't have to have the aperture ones that's another thing that 
most of the time you want to make sure that you have in your studio to allow your customers to control the light um, or yourself to control the light with ease and add lights that aren't necessarily aperture. So we have a lot of other type of lights in, in the studio. The challenge is, and we're actually in the process of fixing that, the Amaranth, because they're kind of like prosumer, consumer grade uh, lighting, cheaper lighting, does not have DMX or wireless DMX. We still have issues where on side this, things don't connect instantly, like with the DMX lights, and you have to try to reset the cove lights and, and go through all of that. There are converters, there's these adapters that you can use in order to transform the Amaranth into uh, DMX supporting lights. We're in the middle of acquiring we need a lot of them because we have, what, 13. I think at the end of the day, we wind up um, keeping 13 lights. The order is there. As soon as they come, then we should have a, a, an easier life to just book, turn on the light and everything uh, turns up on properly. And also, as I mentioned, we're also looking at fixing the cove because there are areas that are a bit darker and brighter in corners and stuff, but that's because of the construction of the cove. Lighting right now is in a really good place, really happy with it. The, the fact, the one uh, benefit of having so many lights next to each other also means that we have that granular control. In a setup like this, you want to first light up your talent, your foreground, the way you need it to, to light the, uh, the foreground, and then figure out how much green screen light you need to bring. Because when you have a key, when you have a variety of lights um, specced out to properly light the subject, you'll have spill of that light on the on the back wall, on the green. What we usually do is we do that first, we light up the talent and then start turning on the green screen lights one by one and adjusting them to have the, the proper IRE because again, there might be hotspots because of the, uh, the stage lights that we're bringing in here. Um, and having 13 of them, only on that wall, there's like seven, and then we have on the sides as well. Means that I can take the um, Amaran center stage three and dim it down because it's too hot and so on. So that helps a lot with the fact that the lights are so close and um, we're in a tighter space um, and we can't flag completely the lights like you would do in a super large stage where you're lighting the talent, but then you can bring flags and bits around to make sure that the green um, wall is not um, capturing some of that light. Again, painful to talk about all of this, but I feel that after uh, weeks and weeks of uh, experimenting and trying bits, now I'm smarter when it comes to how to light a green screen stage. Take what you wish from all of this information. If you have additional questions about lighting a, a stage like this, feel free to comment, feel free to reach out to me or to us, and I'm always happy to share more details. Don't wanna make this video five hours long, uh, getting too much into details. Make sure that you join us in the final episode where we talk about how we got ready for the party, the challenges that we had, the last minute changes, and finally opening up the studio and having people experience uh, everything that we're doing in here. So make sure that you subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.